Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, panel uh, from Maine. Uh, for those who don't know, Maine is the main angel investor network in the Philippines. We have about 80 different members. Uh, we've done dozens of investments. Um, as a little idea of how active we are in the Philippines, we have done about four investments in the last three months. Despite the pandemic, we're still a very active group of investors looking for opportunities in the market. And of course, our scope is not just limited to the Philippines, although we do have a big focus on this market. Uh, we're looking for opportunities in Southeast Asia and also uh, in, on an ad hoc bas basis in, in other regions like the US. So today it's my real pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Samuel Jean Blanc. I work at Google as a regional manager for Google Maps. Um, I used to be the market lead for Google Philippines. So I spent three years uh, in the Philippines, uh, enjoying this beautiful country very much. And as part of my three years in Manila, I actually joined Maine and became a, a very active member and started investing in startups and, and being in the screening committee of, of Maine. Uh, recently, I've moved to uh, Tokyo, uh, where I am now leading a team for Google Maps, but I'm still very, very active and very passionate about the Philippines. So this is why I am here today. Uh, today, we're going to have a, a, a bunch of panelists, uh, all very um, experienced and great investors, and they're going to share their point of view on a number of topics from uh, the situation and the trends in the Philippines to how they invest in startups, all the way to what they're looking for when a startup is, is pitching to them. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to welcome a number of them. And I'll start from uh, from Andrew. Um, so I'd like to welcome Andrew Eskeler, who's the Executive Vice President for Pasudeco Management Corporation, or PMC. Um, Andrew, can you share your screen? Hey, hey, welcome. Do you want to say a few words of welcome to the team? Hey, Sam. Uh, hey, everyone. It's um, great uh, to be part of uh, Philippine Startup Week and to be able to speak with you all. Um, you know, looking really forward to uh, hopefully getting new ideas and sharing um, what we look for in, uh, in investments. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. The next person we have on the panel is Aya Laraya, who's the principal at Ronin Management Consultancy and Holdings. Um, Aya, can you join this call? Yes, fantastic. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Sam. Thank you for having me today. And I look forward to participating in this discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Aya, for, for being with us. The next person we're welcoming is Koi, Koi Navarro, who is a specialist in clean energy at ADB Ventures. Hey, Koi. Hey, Sam. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. And I look forward to just hearing your thoughts or your thesis on the Philippines. Um, I'm a patriot <laughs> and I really want the country to succeed. So uh, it, it means a lot to be part of this panel. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Koi. And I'll, I'll use this opportunity to highlight that Maine is also, of course, a, a nonprofit. So what we're doing here is, of course, trying to ignite the Philippine startup ecosystem. We do have kind of a economic status where we're really trying to, to help uh, companies and startups in the country to, to succeed uh, locally and also internationally. And maybe some of our panelists can tell you a little bit more um, in, in, the, in the next hour. Um, our next panelist is Katie, Katie Velasco, who's the CEO of the V Group of Companies, and she's our last panelist for today. Hey, Katie. Hey, Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me here. I'm so excited to share my knowledge to all those startup companies. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Katie. Thanks for being here. All right. So now you know everyone, uh, Koi, Andrew, Katie, Aya, uh, we're going to be five of us in the next hour uh, asking ourselves a bunch of questions on, again, the, the startup ecosystem in the Philippines, the trends that we're seeing, um, how we're investing, and then finally, what we're looking for in, in founders and companies. Now, as a small reminder, um, you know, if you're an investor and you're listening to this call, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Maine. You can go to maine.ph and look for the, the contact tab. And we're always looking for new investors in the group. Uh, we're already more than 70, but we're always looking for uh, other passionate investors to join us. And then if you're a startup, uh, we're always actively screening startups. Uh, actually, we have never screened more startups than today. Uh, so the space is really on fire. So don't hesitate to reach out as well. We 
generally screen most of the startups that reach out if they do have some seriousness in them. And then, you know, if you go through the, the screening committee, you can actually pitch to our entire group of members and then probably get some investment from, uh, from me. So just as a, as a quick reminder. So let, let's start the, the panel and, you know, we, we're trying to keep it the bouncy and short and, and exciting for everyone and really focus on the essential in our, in our answers. So the first, uh, the first area I want to focus on with, uh, with all of you today is, is really the trends that we're seeing in the Philippines today. And I know you are, are all Filipinos, patriots, passionate about the market. And so I'd like to ask all of you, maybe if you can highlight one or two areas, one or two industries or verticals where you're really seeing some progress and some movement and that you're excited about in the country today. Let's start with uh, Andrew. Andrew, any um, any specific industries you want to highlight? Well, you know, we're really excited about um, companies that are doing things that are kind of in the in the I guess ESG space, environmental, social, and governance um, part of the part of the market. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more entrepreneurs try to do things that are eco friendly. Um, you know, they're trying to address uh, waste or um, plastics or, you know, you try to make things out of organic and biodegradable materials. And, you know, we, we really like, uh, we really kind of like this focus. Um, you know, a lot of people are also looking at like underserved parts of the market where, you know, um, people have ignored. Um, so I, these are two trends that we're pretty excited about. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Koi, any um, any industry that you are excited about? Yeah, absolutely. I think one one particular space that I am uh, watching is uh, last mile logistics. So mm -hmm. as you know, pandemic, you know, uh, home delivery is picked up. And mm -hmm. if you look at India and China, I mean, China is a little more uh, ahead than India, but um, the transition to e-mobility is happening rapidly um, because even at current costs, um, electric two-wheelers are already, maybe you have an OPEX savings of 30%, 35% if you shift to them. Um, and it's just interesting how the market is evolving because um, unlike, you know, traditional two-wheelers, electric vehicles need to be vertically integrated because you need to have charging infrastructure in there. So you see fleet management plays happening in India um, because of the rapid uh, increase in consumption in, in home deliveries. I think the Philippines is about to pick up uh, in that space. And we do have local assemblers of EVs here, actually, but none of them, I mean, I think only one is focusing on two wheelers. So I think that space is really ripe for disruption. Um, and, and, think, and maybe just one thing I'd encourage um, startups who you know, wanna build a company, focus on the market first, uh, it, you know, I mean, and if you have, if you start in a very dynamic market, then your sense, your chance for success is really higher. The amount of interest you get from investors is really going to be there. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, last mile logistics is something I'm interested in, but you know, I'll leave the rest of the others. Great. Thanks, Corey. Last mile logistics and delivery. Very, very exciting space for sure. Um, let me go to Katie. Katie. Which what space are you excited about today? Well, currently right now, Sam, we are uh, more excited about digitalization to help SMEs and large companies connect and bridge the gap. Because we all know that a lot of people during the pandemic, it's still not normalizing and people are not or cannot go out yet of their homes. So especially on tech. We also support Baluk Provincia program through sustainable developments and solutions. So anything to do with um, digitalization and tech, as well as real estate to help support the Baluk Provincia program in the Philippines. That's All it. All right, thanks Katie. Yeah, very wide. I think digitization is a, is a keyword at the moment, but it's also extremely wide. So I like the fact that you also added real estate as a, as a key industry, very nice. Uh, Aya, what do you think? Well, uh, Ronin is actually currently working with a couple of startups in the med tech space because, of course, COVID and you know the medical industry right now, we're all trying to find new ways mm -hmm. from tech consulting to delivery of prescriptions. 
these are things that we're work currently working with startups to sort of re-examine and potentially disrupt. And the other space, of course, is one of my, well, it's close to my heart, is in the fintech space. Mm -hmm. uh, financial literacy is still an issue. And what the pandemic has taught us is that, yeah, at the end of the day, you do have to have some health coverage. But now people are asking, okay, how do I actually get this type of health coverage? What's mm -hmm. out there? So mm -hmm. uh, those are the spaces that we're actually already working in. And it's pretty exciting. Lots of mm -hmm. new ideas. I love it. Yes, yes. I, I think uh, you know for the for the listeners here, you can see that we, we're looking at a wide range of industries. Um, but the keyword here is really you know the move to digital for sure. Um, I, I think on my end, what's um, uh, I think the the whole space is definitely exciting. Um, what I'm I'm really interested in is of course e-commerce and retail, especially in this moment. So how retail is being transformed and how, how some companies are trying to address this. Um, and then how e-commerce is, is simply booming. Uh, I was just reading Amazon's uh, uh, quarterly report and their revenue grew 37% year on year out of a huge base. And if, it's, if, if this is any indicator, um, you know, e-commerce is definitely on fire. Great, great, great. Um, so now, now let, let's, let's be a bit more specific, right? Because we talk, talk about industries and I think industries are very important to guide our startups, but let, let's talk about some startups in specific. now. I understand that some of you don't want to talk about their investment, and that's totally fine. Um, but let's try and mention some some startups you're excited about and that you've seen in the in the market recently. Um, let Let's go with Koi. Koi, what are the, the Filipino or Southeast Asia or global startups? But let's try to stay in the region that you're excited about at the moment. Yeah, you know the e-mobility space in the Philippines is so nascent that I I, I don't really have a pick locally. Mm -hmm. But one particular company I'm excited about is um, a company called Euler Motors, uh, named after the mathematician. Um, it's based out of India, and they they really um, so their goal is to to sort of build three wheelers that can take the place of like mini mini cabs here in the Philippines. Um, and you know, I, one thing that I like about that uh, company is uh, it's a bold bet. You know, to be an OEM, uh, it's a very difficult play, right? But mm -hmm. to start in a niche segment that you can dominate early on mm -hmm. um, and really be ahead in terms of IP when it comes to battery management system, mm -hmm. you know, even being digital first in the sense that, I mean, one, th one thing unique about EVs um, is that unlike internal combustion engines, you can actually track each component because everything is digital, electronic, right? And so if you are in the fleet management business and utilization is a big deal, you can, of course, manage the human uh, resource element, but then if you can also maximize utilization because you can predict what, what, what parts will break down, right, then your operation will be more efficient, all OPEX will be lower. So these small things, I think, give EVs uh, an inherent advantage uh, for last mile delivery. And there's just this company, you know, making a bold bet, attracting investment, um, very focused in niche, but has um, you know ambitions to to expand in other 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 segments as well. So, I really like um, you know sort of that thinking. Um, first of all, uh, when you build a company, to know exactly where you want to come in, what the market dynamics is. Um, so maybe that's one company that I'll, I'll I'll cite. Yeah. Great, 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 great. I like this. Looking at India, um, Aya. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any startup you're excited about at the moment could be Actually, one. We're, we're, we're working with we're working with two right now. So mm -hmm. one in medtech and what they're doing. I, I sort of can't disclose the name, so I hope you understand that. But totally what they're fine. doing is they're basically examining the way patient data can be leveraged mm -hmm. towards better treatment. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, of course, in the Philippines, here you're consulting with several doctors in different hospitals. Mm -hmm. Some of the information sort of gets, shall we say, not efficiently transferred. Mm -hmm. So that's one space we're exploring. And another one that is, in a sense, really it's in nascent stages is this startup that is trying to sort of explore how they can restart tourism after the pandemic. Because, of course, there are a lot of businesses that were really damaged mm -hmm. you know, from a small resort, mom and pop resorts in the islands, the, even the large ones. Mm -hmm. So we're with them already to come up with a business model that can sort of help these types of resorts get back online fast 
because Sometimes. they're expecting that once the restrictions are lifted, but you know, we Filipinos, we love to travel, right? even during the pandemic, people are still traveling even when they should. So that yeah. when it actually becomes legal and open for everybody, then there is, we think, an opportunity there, you know, you know to, to really jump to the head of the line, as it were, to get that first wave of you know, travelers when they start going out actively again. Wow. So it's a, it's a mix of travel, MSMEs, and digitization all together. I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's really just in its nascent stages, but it has us excited because, of course, there's a very strong social component to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially you have islands, the, the tour, the, you know, the, the famous tour islands, Boracay and stuff, of everybody course. got affected. Of so course. That's the space they're trying to enter. Of course. Yeah, well, definitely one, one key uh, learning here for startups listening to us is try and do social good and try to especially yeah. tap into the, the large MSME segment in the Philippines. Yes. That's directly yeah. digitization. Absolutely. Yes. Mm, great tip. Fantastic. Um, Katie, tell us about a startup or two that you're excited about right now. Hey, Sam. Yeah, um, currently I also can't disclose, but there's a startup company that I'm actually helping right now or invested mm -hmm. in. They're trying to help small investors grow their money, especially that because of the pandemic, the retail business, especially those in the malls, um, already lost a lot of uh, funds or lost a lot mm -hmm. of their capital. So what this company does is uh, it connects to several different industries mm -hmm. that are that are strong, such as say real estate mm -hmm. or, uh, or e-commerce. So th there's a vetting company that handles everything to secure that to secure the small investors on investing more so mm -hmm. something like that so um it's very exciting for me since mm -hmm. a lot of people right now or a lot of companies have shut down their operations mm -hmm. and they don't know how to start they don't know where to go or they don't mm -hmm. know where to put money into since they mm -hmm. cannot create their own e-commerce platform or their uh, own uh, digital platform so mm -hmm. this startup is helping them have a piece of the pie. Great. Like super. Yeah. Super. I love this. I hope you can uh, uh, soon disclose uh, this great investment. Soon, soon, definitely. All right. And Andrew? I, I'd love to talk about two, two different startups, mm -hmm. uh, one that we were able to invest in and another one that we did. Um, the first startup I really want to talk about, and I want to talk about this startup because even though we didn't invest in it, I think it's like the perfect um, example of what, what a really good uh, company or startup looks like. Basically, uh, it's called Namzi. Mm -hmm. and it's based out of Singapore. And basically what they looked at was the food that we eat now is pretty much all made from, mm -hmm. you know, the same three things, right? Which is corn, wheat, and soy. And there's this a monocrop culture that uh, is not good for a either the environment because it's just like, you know, um, it's a monocrop thing that doesn't do anything good for the soil. And two, it's not good for our bodies either because there's not much nutrition in those things, right? So. Their idea was to kind of take all of these foods that we're used to eating and re-engineer them with crops that are both good for the soil and contain a lot more nutrients, which are good for people, right? And they wanted to do this simply by kind of replacing certain ingredients um, and just kind of switching them out so that as a consumer, you wouldn't even notice that you're now eating something that's healthier for you and you wouldn't know also that you are improving the health of uh, agriculture. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, they've been working with Montenusen with, to reformulate their Lucky Me noodles. So they have been replacing um, a product that not only adds more nutrition to Lucky Me noodles, mm -hmm. but it also lowers the cost mm -hmm. of Lucky Me. So it's kind of like a no-brainer. Fantastic. So N Nanzi is the is the name of this one, right? Yes, N A M Z. Okay. Fantastic. So you know, they're increasing health of people, they're increasing health of the environment, they're reducing costs, and they're doing it in a way where you know co consumers aren't even you don't even have to make a leap about it. Right? They can continue buying what they're used to buy. They can continue paying 
the prices that they're used to paying. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, there's so much good is being uh, created from this product, right? So Fantastic. I, I really, really like that company. Um, and the second company that we did invest in was mm -hmm. actually um, through uh, Maine, and that is uh, Fortuna Tours. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they've taken um, coconut husks that are normally uh, agricultural waste. Mm -hmm. Instead of allowing that to just be disposed of and go into the trash heap, they've mm -hmm. taken that stuff and they create coolers out of it. Yes. Uh, and as a result, you know, you are you're kind of replacing styrofoam, which is not a good thing to have. And you can also replace hard plastic, which is also not great. It's mm -hmm. something that's the big biodegradable using a, a raw material that would have otherwise been waste. Fantastic. And again, like I said, it's for a cost that is favorable to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So it sets from a economic uh absolutely point. yeah i think we uh, most of us heard the, the fortuna pitch uh and we definitely uh raised some money for for fortuna making coolers out of coconut waste uh, it's a brilliant idea and we're definitely supporting it thanks andrew all right great uh, i'll just uh, you know say a few words on my end i think uh many many areas are so exciting in the philippines right now and I think what the Philippines is starting to do is to create champions for its ecosystem. It's really important to start creating companies that people will know, remember, and that investors across the globe will know the Philippines for. Um, I think one of the, the major exits that happened in the last two years was Coins.ph, uh, which sold to Gojek for more than $70 million. And that was already a first step. And we're seeing a bunch of companies going in the same direction from uh, you know, Kumu being the the, the hottest social app in the moment, uh, which you know is, is a great, great sign for the ecosystem, to of course Ancas, which was hit by the, the pandemic, but is a, is a great local company, uh, all the way to PayMongo. PayMongo is kind of the latest hot star at the moment, uh, trying to replicate Stripe uh, business model in the Philippines. And we're, we're excited to, to see them in the ecosystem, especially with e-commerce booming at the moment. So you see a lot of names, just four, that are already kind of trailblazers for, for the whole ecosystem. And we're, we're, it's great to see them uh, doing so well in, in the Philippines. All right, let's move because, you know, remember we only have an hour. Uh, let's move to, um, to startup pitching. And I think that the great thing about this panel is that you've all heard dozens of startups pitch. And so I'd like to ask you first and foremost, um, what is the one most important thing that you look for when you're evaluating a startup? Um, and I'll start with Aya. Aya, can th just stick to one. What is the one thing that you're looking for? One most important thing. And Aya, the first thing is to unmute yourself. I think that's the most, the, the P0. There you go. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes, thanks, Sam. Uh, the one thing that I really look at at the startup is, do they actually know what they're looking for? As in... Quite often when you sit in a startup, they will pitch the entire thing and then you have to actually ask, okay, how much are you looking for mm -hmm. for how much mm -hmm. of your company? I think that's very basic. Mm -hmm. You're pitching. And if your entire three, five minute, whatever pitch, you never mention how much money mm -hmm. you want and how much of your company you're willing to offer in exchange for that, then to me, that's a major red flag because it means you've never even actually thought about it. So here you are pitching and you don't have that. And sadly, that happens very often, or it will just be half. Okay, I want to raise $100,000. Okay, in exchange for what? Mm -hmm. So we'll just give $100,000 and you, you're not going to offer us anything? Or we want to raise a note. Okay, it's fine. You want to raise a note. So what are the terms of your note? Mm -hmm. That's really that. something that, that I think someone who is pitching should be clear on so that you know a person's time is not wasted. Mm -hmm. So the terms are too rich, then okay, then I won't bother calling you. But if it's interesting, then automatically, hey, okay, it's within my wheelhouse. I'll go set a meeting already. I love this. So for all the startups out there, know what you're asking for before you actually pitch. I love this. Great tip, uh, Aya. Uh, Katie, Katie, what is the, the one most important thing that you're looking for?
the question is so difficult, Sam, because there's one thing, right? Uh, maybe currently I can say it's the the market opportunity mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. startup. Yeah, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. I think the market all. opportunity. How big is the opportunity? All right, I love this, Koi. <laughs> Yeah, Katie beat me to it. <laughs> but market is also, so, you know, you can edit this out if you like, but I think market is key. And I think what I look for really is nuance and understanding the market. So when you say, I am targeting the last, last mm -hmm. uh, mile cargo mm -hmm. segment, I want data on two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers. And I want you to, I want to be confident that you actually know what the segment is, who your competitors are, um, and, and, and then you go to competitive advantage in technology, right? But I would echo what Katie said. I think it's sometimes it's just too early to really know, you know, whether the startup would succeed, whether there's a market fit, product market fit. But if the market is big enough, then there's room to sort of evolve, right? And 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 that's that's that matters to me a lot. I love this the nuance part. Yeah, we, we see too many times startups just coming in with a a Tam and a Sam, and it's basically the whole e-commerce e uh, opportunity worldwide. And of course, it's billions of dollars, but then they haven't refined their thinking at all. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Koi. Great tip, um, Andrew. And and guys, by the way, feel free to jump in if you want to add anything to any of the other panelists on, on this specific discussion. Andrew, tell us. So for us, uh, the, the number one thing uh, I, I look for is, would I be a customer, right? Like, what, am I interested in buying uh, what you're selling? Am I interested in this service that you want to provide? Because if, if, if I'm not interested, then, uh, then I don't understand it, right? And if I don't understand it, then it's not worth getting into. Um, so if I can if I can approach an investment as a consumer that yes, like I I want this, then I have a much better understanding of how things should go and you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Very good tip. Very good tip. Make the investor the consumer. Wow, like this. Um, so Aya said, "What are you looking for? You need to come in with a clear ask." Second, the market opportunity and nuancing. We're going deeper in the market opportunity. Finally. Uh, would you be a consumer as an investor? I'll, I'll add in on my end uh, the importance of the team. And I'm sure all of you had that in mind as well. Uh, the importance of the founding team. How strong are you as, as founders? Uh, how tightly knit? How robust? How resilient are you? And, um, you know, as an example, we've invested as, as Maina in a startup called Taxumo. And Taxumo has been at it for four years now. And one of the reasons we invested is because we've seen that they had gone through challenges. They had to uh, reboot their business model. They had to uh, rewrite their own um, their own product, and now they were in a space where, because of all those challenges, they they had become so robust and they had proven that they could be resilient in in any market. So that's one of the key reasons why why we invested. And so you know, as if, uh, for startups listening to this, you know, please come in and show us how strong you are as a team, and when you do pitch, on top of of course everything that the panelists have just said. Great. So now let, let me ask a, a trickier question. Uh, what is more important, a brilliant idea or a flawless execution plan? And you cannot say both. That's a wrong answer. So you have to choose between the two. And I'll start with you, Koi. Well, I mean, execution to me is, is important because I think you can realize the value of an idea only when you execute properly. So no matter how brilliant the idea is, um, you know, it, the execution really sets the ceiling of how far you can go. Um, not to say that the idea is not important, but, you know, you made me choose one. <laughs> so execution it is. All right. Great. Um, and by the way, guys, if you have examples of all of this, like, you know, you have a startup in mind, it doesn't have to be, it could be a, a global case study, but a, a good idea of someone that had, you know, a normal idea, but executed really well. You know, I, I'm sure uh, people would love to hear it. Um, Katie, what about you? Brilliant idea, great execution. What would you choose? Same with Koi. I go for execution, flawless execution. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot oh. of ideas out there, and you can always uh, sort of like select from all the ideas, but the execution is very important. You won't be able to... Uh, 
to have a successful ending or successful customer relation if you don't have a flawless implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna ask Andrew, but I, I think I know the answer. Andrew. Same, same as everyone else, you know. Um, if you look at ideas, they're all, they're not so different, right? You can't really differentiate yourself based on an idea. But so it really comes down to how you execute, mm -hmm. how, you, how you execute, because um, ideas are kind of a dime a dozen and it uh, doesn't really matter. Yeah, I, I would I would really agree to this uh, to this and and say that it's actually a positive sign for startup. Like if you're a startup out there or you're a founder and you're like ah I don't know if I should go ahead because my idea you know is not perfect or I'm not creating the next uh, Uber or Google or Airbnb. Yeah, don't don't worry about it. What will be important is how well you can execute. And you know startups are not always huge disruptors. They could be coming in with a proven business model and just doing better than than the rest you know that's why you have lyft and uber that's why you have you know joe ride and Ancas. i mean that's why you have so much competition on similar segment all right so another question um you know and again that's because you've heard so many startups pitch what are the common mistakes and i think on this one i will allow two two answers uh, common mistakes that people make when they're pitching to vcs or angels and that you wish they would stop making. So let let me start with uh, let's start with Katie. And guys, you know, feel free to jump in if if you want to add to anything that the, the other panelists are saying. Katie. Okay. Two most common thing that I actually see with startup is that I always see in all the startups they. Uh, since there's no value yet, there's no appraised value of their corporation. Mm -hmm. Some of them tend to go beyond what they really need and they value their company higher than what is expected. So that's really a no-no for me. So you need to, you need to be very um, transparent and you need to be very conservative. The pessimistic approach is always best for a startup. Okay, sorry guys, but it is what it is. The so pessimistic your investor hat, you know. <laughs> you must be cheap. You must be cheap. No, I, I really like this tip, Katie. I would agree. Yeah. Number two is uh, the cash flow projections that you bring in. Of course, people uh, in startup pitch, so sometimes they don't really touch into the, the projections, but some mm -hmm. of the startups project really, really optimistically. So that is kind of also a, a bad connotation when it comes to a startup. So those are the tips, guys. I like this. And, and I have to say, I, we've seen so many startups that uh, say, oh, in three years time, we'll be at a hundred million dollar um, annual run rate. And, and we know that it's not, it's not realistic. So yeah, be realistic in your valuation, be realistic in your expectations and, um, and, and, and cash flow projections. Great, great tip, Katie. Thank you. Let's go to Aya. Aya, uh, yeah. common mistakes you see from startups pitching to, to angel investors and that you wish they would stop making? Number one would be the life story. I mean, they, they tell you too much information about their personal lives, about how they started and, and everything, such that I don't really need to hear that. You know, I don't need to know. I need to know your story as it relates to the startup. What experiences, what skills do you have that are mm -hmm. pertinent to what you're pitching? But I don't need to know too much about your personal life, that you've gone through this, you've done this, you came from this. Uh, to me, that just distracts from what you're actually trying to do. So that's the first one. The second one is just to echo a scale is when the numbers simply don't make sense. Mm. I'm a finance person by background and training and Sometimes when you see those projections, you really wonder where they came from. And I guess also just to be more specific, when I see projections for expenses, somehow I think a major error is the expectation that the founders are not supposed to get paid. Uh -huh. I examine, I mean, if you're really going to run a business and you're going to run it full time and put your maximum effort into it, end of day, you have to get paid competitively. Of course, mm -hmm. not exactly 
competently, but your skills have to be properly valued because otherwise, just pay someone else to do it, then do something else to earn a living. Mm -hmm. So that's also a common error when people say that, oh, we're not paying ourselves and we're doing this. To me, that's not a good sign because that means your numbers assume that someone has to work for free. Mm -hmm. And no business really prospers if people are expected to work for free. Mm -hmm. I mean, not profits, okay, maybe they can you know, make ends meet. But if you're saying you're a for-profit business and your numbers make sense because the founders are not getting paid competitively, then that means, you know, at a certain point, okay, what happens when you actually have to hire a full-time CEO or whatever who now has to be paid competitively? So then Great. your numbers are back. Yes, so yes, those yes. Two, those two things. I love it. I love it. And I hope everybody's taking notes. This is uh, great. Um, Koi, one mistake, two mistakes that you hear all the time. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I just echoing the valuation, uh, maybe from a different angle, because I think once you make a valuation and you actually succeed in making an investor accept that valuation, you are then obligated to realize that value, right? Uh, and one mistake is if you overshoot that, you risk a down round in the future which could lead to you being, you know, diluted heavily, right? Uh, if there are uh, clawback uh, clauses in, in the agreement. And that really ruins, I mean, especially if you're a fast-growing startup, um, it should be really balanced because you have to have enough room to get in multiple rounds in the future, right? So you have to plan ahead, only raise what you need, don't overvalue yourself. So it's a, it's a relationship that you want to enter with when you, when you have an investor in, and you just need to be fair on both sides. So I think it's an art form. So that part is hard to get right uh, without experience. Um, and I guess the other thing that maybe is worth sharing is like I, I've seen a number of tech, technology-based startups that uh, really haven't thought through the scalability aspect of it. Because, I mean, of course, there's tech, but customer, customer acquisition costs money. Um, is it, if it's a B2B play, can you do it in a very efficient way so that customer acquisition cost is low? Because at the end of the day, if your overhead costs increase directly along with your, 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 your growth, right, then it may not be as scalable as you think. So, um, just being mindful about the unit economics and how that's layered, I, I think is really important if you're a technology startup. I love this. And I, yeah, I, I hope everybody's taking notes. Yeah, yeah, lovely, lovely advice. Um, think about growth, think about scalability, and think about the cost of it as well. Um, if you're, you have to hire more and more people to grow less and less fast, your business model is probably not, not, not the most robust. Love it. Let, let's end with Andrew. Andrew, some things that you hear that you're like, oh my God, what are they saying this? Yeah, I mean... I guess kind of similar to Koi, I've heard pitches where um, where the business model, you know, they describe it and they describe their costs and then you just kind of go through their costs and you realize they can't sell this, they can't sell this thing profitably, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. Like the, the, the in, it costs too much to sell at a price that's competitive to the market. And if you can't do that, then, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, right? You, you really need to have a product that that makes that you can sell cheaper than you can provide it for, right? And I think a lot of startups, especially in the U.S., right, they kind of use venture capital money to to subsidize their consumers, and it's just not as a sustainable business model. So, you know, it, it really has to kind of make sense where you can have a, a profitable product to sell. And then maybe the second thing is just, you know, where's your moat? You know, where's your where's your barrier to entry? What are you gonna do differently that Ayala or you know whoever can come in, replicate, throw in way more money than you have, and just kind of steal all your business, right? So, mm -hmm. so those are kind of the two things that I don't feel like enough uh, startups try to think about and address. Mm -hmm. Great, great ones. My gosh, we got eight, eight advice, eight tips, and they're all uh, more robust one than, than the others. I, I love it. Um, I, I'd say um, I, I just I would just add, and I, I agree with everything that you guys have said, really. Um, I add that I see sometimes 
uh, founders that uh, compete when they're pitching. You know, like we ask them questions and then one is giving an answer and the other one jumps in and say, no, let me, you know, sorry, let me answer this one. And then it shows this kind of scene of chaos where you're like, who's in charge? Who's doing what? Why aren't roles, you know, and responsibilities more clear? Uh, because if you're doing this at the start of the company, imagine when things get more complicated. Uh, so an easy one that people often forget. I mean, I've seen, I was sitting in a pitch once where it was a father and a son, and then the son would start all of the answers and the father would jump in halfway and cut him out and then say something different, right? And of course, that's a huge no-no for for investors in, in my point of view. Um, yeah, and then, then you know, the, the second one, definitely uh, something we often don't hear enough is, is sales and growth. And I think it really goes back to your point around scalability, Koi. Um, you know, as a, for a startup to succeed, you need a, you know, an idea, you need fantastic execution and an inside execution comes sales. If you're unable to sell your idea and go out and find consumers, not find people that find it cool, but people that would actually pay money for it, you will never be successful. And often we, there's this part missing and then you see a startup after a year, they're like, you know, we're starting customer acquisition. We don't know what to do. And that's because they haven't thought about the, the sales part of their whole pitch enough. So there you go. For startups listening out, 10 tips that I would write down and maybe frame in your room. Uh, if you want to pitch to main, remember main.ph, feel free to leave us a message and and, and avoid those, those 10 mistakes. All right. Uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes we have left, I'd like to maybe get a bit specific on, on investments. And, uh, you know, we're all seasoned uh, angel investors here in this call. Um, so again, you know, if you can get into specifics, please do so that it's, it's clear for startups. If you can't, you know, you don't have to reveal anything, but let me go around the room a little bit and uh, to give an idea of the, to the people listening, when was the last time you made an investment? And, you know, this, 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 uh, to, what, to the extent you can share, let's, let's start with, with Katie. The last time I made an investment, uh, mm. the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, that was November, that was last Tuesday. I made an investment sure. last Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, went, you went shopping. Yeah. It feels like you went shopping. Yeah. I just feel like there's a huge potential with this company, the startup company who helps uh, small investors or small businesses grow the money where they don't know where to put uh -huh. anymore because their businesses are dying. So that's it. I, I love it. They need they need support in, uh, in corporate corporate wise. That's what they're missing. They're good in implementation. Like what I've said, the idea is great and the implementation is also great with a startup. What's lacking with them is uh, corporate, legal, marketing and sales generation. So that's where I'm good at. That's where the group is good at. So we help them with that. Whoa, so, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, great. <laughs> that, thanks, Katie. So a week ago, my gosh, so fresh. Uh, Aya. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been about earlier, about late last year, actually, in that med tech that we're working with. So mm -hmm. we like what they're trying to do. So we're actually now part of it. So we became, well, I became the CFO basically to look at the numbers. Oh, wow. And we were looking to launch already by within the next couple of months. So it's something that I really like their model. And, you know, we've had to tweak it. And we came in because uh, this is something that I wanted to add was we came in very similar to Katie in that we filled a lack that they needed, which is on the financial side that, okay, they had an idea, they had a product, but they didn't really know how to price it. Uh, the cash flows, of course, you have to manage that because, you know, when, especially when you in a B2B model, they never pay COD. There will have to be terms, but while you know people are takes time to pay and all of that then you mm -hmm. still have to pay your salaries mm -hmm. and stuff so yeah. that has to be managed as well mm -hmm. i guess just as a final thing lang just to remember that if you're building a founding team this is something that i guess jumps through all the questions we've talked about today please make sure that someone in your team actually understands numbers i know that sounds mm -hmm. 
uh, bad, but you never hire a CTO who's never actually built anything or worked with the technology that they are supposed to be working with. Mm -hmm. And sad to say that quite a number of startups, when you look at their founding team, no one has ever been trained or has actually been instructed on how to actually manage cash flows. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to convince me you know how to handle 100,000 or 10,000 whatever dollars mm -hmm. when no one in your team has ever, ever been taught how to do it. <laughs> and that's something yeah. I think really needs to be addressed. And it's, I think that's what happens to, and that's how valuations start going awry. You know, people just start throwing numbers and say, okay, let's try it. Oh, I saw it on Shark Tank. They asked for a million dollars. Okay, let's ask for a million dollars or what? But right. do they not actually support it? And if they actually get the million dollars, is there someone there who actually knows how to deploy that million dollars? Or mm -hmm. is everyone going to get a new MacBook? Mm. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that sort of thing. So uh, we can hear the, the, the accountant in you uh, speaking, Aya. Yeah, a great, <laughs> great tip. We, we heard Katie earlier on saying, you know, you must value cheap. And we heard the investor, and now we're hearing you saying we know numbers. Absolutely, no. I mean, these are great tips. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, Next. I just have to have the skills, so that's it. Love it, uh, Andrew. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, uh, Fortuna closed. I guess last month, right? <laughs> My gosh. Right. So yeah, I agree. that was the last time. Yeah. Great. Um, anything you're you're adding to this investment? Because one of the message that I'm hearing here from Katie and Aya is investors are not just there for the money. They're adding skills. They're adding their own competence. And Katie is there to help with oh, yeah. four different things, marketing, sales. Uh, Aya is there to help with the numbers and our CFO of the company he's invested in. Uh, so, you know, the, the message for investors and startups out there is investors are not just there for the money. Um, anything you're adding, you've added to a startup before besides, of course, just your, your investment, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, I don't really believe in being a passive investor. I, I try to help uh, the startup as much as I can. Um, so, you know, we've invested in a, in a fintech company once. And so, you know, I was helping them try to find clients and stuff and introducing them to everyone I knew. When they were looking for bank clients, I was trying to introduce them to all the banks I knew. So, you know, when we invest, we really try to open up our, our contact book, our, our Rolodex, and just try to provide them with all the resources they need in mm -hmm. terms of our work. Um, we, don't, we don't really try to get involved in the, in the management or the day-to-day -day operations because, again, that's, you know, we're not signing up to, to manage. Mm -hmm. But as much as we can help in terms of, you know, getting the things that they need and just broadening uh, their resources, we're, we're always happy to help that and um you know th there was a there was a recent um startup that came to us and when we realized that yeah there's there's nothing we can kind of add value mm -hmm. to it was like hey guys i don't think this is good for us lovely so you add your network we, we, we could create a startups guys i mean there's the no, Aya could be the finance guy katie you can be sales andrew can open up his network and then koi i, I don't know what koi Cool. what is your last investment and, and anything you add on top of money? <laughs> you know, I have a confession to make. So I am not such an active investor because I have a full-time job and I feel kind of bad, actually. Um, last investment I made was in an education startup um, and they're doing well. Uh, it was last year. It's great. Uh, but, you know, I do envy you guys uh, with the, by the fact that you can actually put in time and, and really work with a startup. I wish I, wish I had that. Um, I... You know, I, you know, I mean, maybe this is um, relevant to some people who are thinking about joining me, like people who have, are professionals who have a full-time job. Uh, one thing I like about Maine is there are a lot of strong members who can represent your interests in a board. Um, and hopefully, if with enough successful investments, you, you will have the luxury of really uh, moving out of your full-time job right? <laughs> and, and, and just focusing on investing. But um, I do think this is a, an interesting avenue to learn about, you know, the Philippines itself, the fabric of the uh, ecosystem, the industries. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, I have to say that I've unfortunately added minimal value uh, <laughs> in the start apart from money, but I do look forward to being more active um, and freeing up some of my time for some startups. So, Koi, 
I love this because <laughs> if you if you were also saying, hey, I, you know, I'm I don't know, I'm 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 selling, I'm giving out flyers on the street. You know, people would have thought that all investors are active, and that's not that's not true. Some investors are really there for to invest, uh, and you know, like you, they don't have uh, all the time in the world to put into the startups, and that's okay. Uh, they're there to finance the ecosystem, so don't worry. There's no no shame at all. Um, I think it's actually a good representation of what's happening uh, um, in in the ecosystem today. Some are active, some are not, and that's fine. Uh, that's not you know not everybody can be. So so thanks, Koi, for the for the openness. Um, you know, and maybe you, know, you could say a few things about ADB Ventures, but maybe that's a a different discussion. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention myself. Um, Oh, I, I'm, I'm very active. So my last investment was uh, two months ago in a company called Awesome, O-S-O-M-E. They're based in Singapore. They've just announced their three million round uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, and I'm, of course, uh, actively trying to help them to, to scale some of, of their business. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so let, let's, uh, I have a few, let, let's be a bit more uh, quick on this one because we only have, you know, a few minutes left. Um, help me or, or help the, the listeners uh, understand what is your process like when you're making an investment decision? You know, just in a nutshell, you know, where do you start? You know, how do you say, when do you say, okay, yes, I'm going to invest and how much I'm going to invest? Uh, if you can just run the listeners through the thought process, I think that would be super helpful for the startups listening here. Um, Aya, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Well, to me, it's always about the numbers. Okay. Uh, do the numbers make sense? It, it's really that. The okay. idea can be good, but if, as was said, if the pricing is off, doesn't look like they can actually scale, then it's not attractive. And the valuation, yeah, and by numbers, we're also talking about the valuation because to me, of course, as an early stage investor, you're looking for multiples. So if your pitch to me is, okay, my company is worth 100 million already today, even though I haven't made an, a single sale, it's supposed to be worth 100 million, fine. Alongside that, you have to tell me how you're going to get that to 500 million. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm buying it now and it's supposed to be worth 100, I'm not going to be happy with just a 20, 30% return. We're talking multiples. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking and then you say, okay, then I ask you, okay, how do you plan to multiply that? And you can't give as clear an answer as to why it's worth 100 right now, mm -hmm. then basically saying that, okay, you want me to assume you will do everything right so that it's valued at that 100 you're saying, but you actually have no clue how to get it to 500 to make it worth my while to put my money in it. Mm -hmm. So to me, it shows that the, shall we say, the founder really is looking for someone to work with and not just someone who wants to put in money and, you know, won't ask how it how to get it back. Mm -hmm. So that, right. it's it's yeah they're really looking for a partnership more than just you know money. I love this. Thanks, Aya. Um, Koi, um, what is your thought process? And you know, on the angel side on the venture side, you know. Yeah, you know it, it has evolved, and you know it started as like. Who is the main member I admire the most, and is he investing? <laughs> that was the first. That was the first method. Um, I I do say that you know it, it's you know, I, I I'm I'm ahead in terms of the investments that I I sort of process that way. But you know more recently, as I you know learn more about early stage investment, um, I, I again you know I started about the market. Um, and what I really look for is a real understanding about what the problem is. You know. Um, uh, sometimes it, people make solutions that are looking for a problem and, and, and you know, it, it, you can really smell that quickly. So to me, if you have a nuanced understanding of the market, you know what's the niche segment you want to come in, it's easy to identify who the competitors are. And then you can then differentiate whether the value proposition is defensible or not. Is there a core IP that, you know, will elevate you against the competition? So. Um, it starts with a problem, with a market, and then I go into the the solution itself. Um, and I guess the last bit, of course, is what you mentioned, Sam. It, it's the team. Um, I am a little wary about super young founders, if all of them are super young and, you know, lacks a bit of experience. I do look for energy from younger entrepreneurs, but also some discipline for more seasoned uh, professionals. I mean, 
granted, it's hard to find that mix ready, uh, you know, you know, up front, right? Um, and maybe they'll pick up some of the parts of the management team as they go along. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's my process. Market, um, solution, the scalability of that solution and the defensibility of that solution, and then the ability to execute, which is, of course, boils down to the team. Love it. Thanks, Koi. Um, Andrew. Sure. I, I guess I'll tell you the story about one startup um, that we, we didn't end up investing in, but I'll, I'll tell you the process just so, you know. So I, I read about this cool company uh, in in an article, and they had a product that, wow, it sounds like I, I'd really be a fan of this product. So I reached out and contacted them. Um, so that's the first step. I think I'd be a customer. And then I met I met the team, and they were two great people and I really like them and I, I like their attitude. They got along well together. Um, and so, you know, the, the management, the team looked good. Um, and they presented their uh, their business model. And I thought the economics made sense. I thought they were competitive in terms of the alternatives out there. Um, so again, the economics were good. Um, but then, but we didn't end up addressing because it was just too early. They hadn't made any sales yet, um, and so you know that that's that's the only thing that kind of held us back. But that was kind of the the process. It's, am I a customer? How's the team? How are the economics? And then what what stage? What stages is the start All right, I love it. Um, Katie, you wanna? Yeah, well, I'll I'll be direct to the point. Like whenever we. Um check out startup companies the first thing we really uh we really want to see is the quality of the pitch because it's such a short period of time that you can get our attention or get the investor's attention so the quality of pitch is very important what's in there and it has to address the market opportunity the growth Mm -hmm. potential scalability and uh, the numbers of course is very important your valuation is very important and then your terms and then what's your solution to an existing problem? Or are you just like what Koi said, are you creating a problem mm-hmm. and then solving it? So uh, there, there's a big, uh, big um, no-no if you're not solving the existing problems that we have. And mm-hmm. then lastly is, I guess, the team and the growth of the team. Because a, um, a lot of startups, yes, there are founders, currently mm-hmm. two people, three to five people in the team. But what, when they scale, how do they see their team? How mm-hmm. do they, how would they grow their team as well with the same vision and culture of the company? So that's very mm-hmm. important to for for your next team or your expansion to have the same culture as how the founders created it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love this, and you know, working in a company that has a very strong culture like Google, it, it does it definitely resonates uh, absolutely awesome uh, we're, we're towards the end i think i have one more, more question i'll just uh you know g- give a bit of insight on, on my personal thought process i i often describe angel investing as uh, apartment hunting with a human factor a big human factor so you know imagine you you step into a new condo and you, know, you have a first impression right and that's when a founder pitches to you you're like oh do i like these guys or not you know this there's a there's a big part of feeling really at least for me um, and then once you visited it and you've seen the view, you go back home and then you start studying the numbers and then you look at the, the rent, the fees, the area, and that's when kind of the rational part comes in. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a human decision. So you try to meet again with the founders, you see if there's a fit, you see if you like them. Uh, there's a big kind of likability factor to all of this and, 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 uh, and kind of match in terms of personalities. And then, you know, Koi said something super, super interesting. I don't know if you guys caught it. He said, I invest if someone at Maine that I respect invests. And so for the investors and the startups out there, there's a big um, a kind of um, a herd factor, definitely in angel investing. I mean, there, there's FOMO. You don't want to miss out. Your friends are investing and they're going to get a, a nice return. But also, you know, if, if there's a, a trust relationship amongst investors, if someone you really trust is investing, you will probably you know, listen a bit more carefully because it, it's someone that you respect and, and look up to. Um, so that's how I would describe my, my own my own process. 
Awesome. Let let me ask one last question because we're at time, everyone. Um, and and it's 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 on return on investment. And again, uh, for the people listening, Maine is not a for profit. So you know we're not looking to make. I mean, members definitely are, but as as a group, we're not looking to make billions of dollars every single every single year. However, of course, we're looking for some kind of return on investment, and that's why I want to uh, end the panel with. Um, so I'll, I'll just go around the table. Aya, when you look at the um, the timetable for return on your money, what, what are what, what are you looking at? Well, you have to give them, of course, a chance to execute. So at least a couple of years, two, three years. And what we're looking at really is on that first year, once the money's there, are they going to hit all of those milestones that they said they would? And that's where having a good pitch comes in. Do they really have a sense of where they're supposed to go and how they're going, how they plan to get there? Like, okay, we need to reach X number of sales or X number of units or whatever widgets there is. Mm -hmm. Was that reached? Now, if yes, great. If no, then is it something that can be corrected? Maybe it was something external. Like, okay, pandemic happened. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? Do we go back to the drawing board or is it just a matter of waiting something out? So at least a couple of years. I mean, you have to give them that chance. I mean, mm -hmm. it cannot be that, okay, immediate results. And again, you know, it's a very inexact science at the end of the day. All of those projections are exactly that, projections. Right. If they happen, fantastic. But they rarely get hit on the nose. Mm -hmm. They very rarely get hit on the nose. So you have to give them a chance, basically. Right. Well, unless you're, you're Facebook or, or Google or Kumu, I'm guessing <laughs> yeah. it's the other way around. Yeah, you're yeah. great. Great tip. Thanks, Aya. Uh, Katie. Oh, I, Katie froze. Let's, let's go to Koi. Koi, you know, timetable in terms of ROI. Um, I think what Aya answered is when you start to see results. And then the, the other question is really, when do you want to get your money back? You know, what is your, your perspective in time? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, three to five years, um, you know, uh, it really depends on how early the bet is, right? Um, maybe you like the team, you like the market, but the product is not there yet. And then maybe you need to give them maybe two years to refine the product. Um, and then maybe they'll gain traction on the fifth year and maybe raise a series A then and you can exit. So I say three to five years would be uh, okay for me. I mean, uh, I agree with Aya, certainly you need to give them time, um, mm -hmm. depending on the company. Yeah. All right. Wow. Three to five years. Great. Andrew? Uh, sorry, can I just say something regarding your last question? Uh, sure. One of the points you made before in terms of co-investors. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say we, we've co-invested with a lot of um, people that I guess you would you would read about if you pick up like a Forbes, uh, which is people in, in the Philippines. And I just have to say it's not always um, what you expect, right? You can have mm -hmm. a lot of times you can invest with a very powerful, very wealthy person. That doesn't mean anything for your investment um, in my experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of like investing and try, and try to make a decision based on who's investing with you, unless, unless you've worked with that person before, or unless like you have a relationship and you know what they're like as an investor, it's uh we haven't been we haven't done well uh kind of following that principle um so I, I just, oh wow no that's great that's fantastic i love conflicting views absolutely absolutely i like this and then so and then to your question now in terms of a uh, current timetable you know i guess what again what, what i mentioned before is we want to we want to see the company make money and we want to see them uh, be viable probably if not before we invest and at least not too long after a year or two after but in terms of an exit we don't we, we haven't been we don't really make investments with exits in mind we're more of the we kind of want to hold them forever and just you know see them grow and work with them and uh so in terms of time people we don't really have a time people right ROI. As long as gotcha. as long as you can grow your company and do well, you know, we, that's mm -hmm. what we have to do. 
Wow, you're you're a dream investor. Please, everyone, uh, send your pitches to Andrew. This is uh, someone you can definitely invest with. Great, Katie. Let's let's wrap this up. Um, what is your timetable in terms of return on your money? Well, for me, it's two to three years. It really depends on the target. And if you are hitting your target, like say, for example, the first year, um, your timelines are really met. Same with Aya. Mm -hmm. And then also how you're able to uh, you're able to solve or adapt to the problems. Because when a, a startup company is a startup company, so there would be a lot of changes in the structure and you might see different scenarios affecting your market. So even if you have those factors you can still hit or i can we would still want to um hit the two to three years roi yeah hmm. all right very interesting yeah i i think there's there's a number of uh definition of roi that i should have clarified you know this there's, there's roi on i've invested when can i see the benefit of my investment in the company and i agree with all of you i think the two three year time frame is often what we're looking for um, you know, to see the growth really take off because most of the time when you're an angel, you're investing at kind of pre-growth stage. And then there's the exit, which Andrew mentioned. Um, VCs usually have a, an eight-year perspective. So, you know, you invest a dollar on on, day, on on year one and then you you exit on year eight, uh, which is a very long time frame. Um, the reality, I think, for everybody in this group is that we haven't really uh, gotten many exits yet in the Philippines. Uh, an eight-year, you know, you need to wait a bit before you see the, the those results. So I think we should come back next year to Philippine Startup Week and 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 wish we have an exit and we can we can chat more about this. But definitely, I mean the the key learning here for our listeners is we're investing on the long term. You know, we're here to not to invest and get our money out in, in six months time. We're we're here really to to accompany you on the long term. And and I would agree to Andrew's point. Um, you know, don't don't the hurt factor could be a, a bad factor. Uh, but it's a reality, though, Andrew, and uh, you know, people do invest because other people invest. Is it the right decision, though? I agree with you. It, sometimes it is not, and, and your experience kind of proves it. So with that, I'll, um, I'll, I'll end the panel. We're you know, seven minutes uh, above time, but I'd like really to thank all of you for being here, Koi, Andrew, Katie, Aya. Um, I think what really struck me is that uh, the diversity of your answers, you know, in terms of tips, in terms of how you invest, in terms of your last investment. I really, really like how uh, kind of complementary this group is. And then for our listeners out there, this is really what Maine is all about. You know, think of this group times 10, so 70 or times 15, 70 members getting into a room uh, regularly and just bouncing off ideas, creating startups and really trying to help the ecosystem. Uh, this is what Maine is all about. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm staying. This is why I'm investing. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for, for being in this call. Can you just unmute and uh, and, and cheers to the thanks. listeners? Yeah, thanks, right. Sam, for great thank moderation. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And, and oh, oh, my God, I'm forgetting my mission. Don't forget, main.ph is the place you have to go if you either want to invest or if you want to uh, to pitch to us. We're open uh, both ways. Thank you, everyone.